Hi guys, and welcome back to the Bonsai and YouTube channel. I'm Josh, and today we're going to be talking about all the care aspects of Japanese black pine. So stick around. Alright, so Japanese black pine seems to be one of those species where there's a lot of confusion around pruning and styling and a lot of the horticulture aspects of the, the species. So today we're just going to go through all these points and make sure you stick around and watch all of them because a lot of this stuff actually mixes in with each other. So sunlight and soils and watering and soils, fertilizing, all that kind of stuff, it all melts in with each other. So make sure you learn every aspect of this species for the best success. Now, let's jump into it. The first thing we've got up here is the two laws of Japanese black pine. And if you understand these two laws, you're gonna have better success straight out of the gate. So, what are they? The first law of Japanese black pine is the energy is in the root system. Not like our junipers, where the energy is actually in the foliage, but with Japanese black pine, all that energy is in the root system. So before we perform any major work on a Japanese black pine, we need to make sure that that root system is happy and healthy, okay? And that should be our number one goal and priority when cultivating Japanese black pine, is making sure that we've got a happy and healthy root system. Now, the second law of Japanese black pine is energy distribution is in the needle mass, okay? So wherever we've got more needles on a Japanese black pine, that's where we're going to have more energy. We want to be able to evenly distribute that energy, so we need to do needle plucking to do that. But we'll talk about that a little later on. So let's move on to our next segment here, which is sunlight, okay? So like most other bonsai, outside, direct sunlight. Japanese black pine will absolutely love it. Now, we can't have them inside behind a glass window because we, we know that glass blocks out UV light. Um, also too, glass can heat up, causing problems for your Japanese black pine. And in very, very rare circumstances, you can actually cause heat spots on your tree. So, not behind a window, not behind glass on a balcony, none of that kind of stuff. Direct sunlight for Japanese black pines. No ifs and or buts. Um, the more sunlight you can give this tree, the better. The needles basically act like solar panels, and the more solar panels you have out in the sun, the more energy that you're gonna have in your tree. Okay, winter care. When it comes to winter for Japanese black pine, anything below freezing, we need to protect the tree. These are coastal trees, so they're used to that warmer, more humid environment. So if you live in an area that gets below freezing during the winter times, you need to protect your Japanese black pine. If you've got a red pine, which is very similar to black pine, they're a little bit more hardier against frost. They can get down to about minus six degrees Celsius. But with your Japanese black pine in particular, anything under freezing, okay? And then when we protect the tree, I'm not telling you to take your tree inside the house especially if you've got the heater on, fireplace, something like that over winter, you're gonna confuse the tree. It still needs a cold dormancy period. So how do we protect the tree? We put it in an unheated garage or we put it in a greenhouse, okay? Just to protect it from that frost. So anything below freezing, protect the tree, but don't put it inside where you've got a heater running. It's pretty simple in terms of that. So when it comes to your sunlight, once again, just to recap, as much unfiltered sunlight as you can give the tree. And in winter, anything below freezing, we need to protect the tree. All right, let's move on to our next section. All right, watering our Japanese black pine. Now, this is a species that can tolerate a little bit of drought. It's a pretty hardy tree. But we want to keep in mind that we still don't want to let that uh, soil system completely dry out. That is not good for any bonsai, because what happens if we take away that balance of water and oxygen, which we know is so important in the bonsai environment, 
If we take away that balance of water and oxygen and we have just oxygen in our soil substrate, what's going to happen is those root tips are going to dry out and they're not gonna take up any water. And if the tree's not taking up any water, it's dead, okay? So we need to always keep some level of moisture in the soil system. So during the, the growing season, spring through summer, it'll slow down in autumn, but during those mainly spring and summer seasons, water mobility in that tree is gonna be very high. So you may have to water two to three times a day, depending depending on your circumstances, okay? So this can come down to your soil substrates and this, this can come down to your environment. There's some places where it rains most of the time of the year. So you're not gonna be watering a lot, but you're gonna need a very well draining soil system. So this is where I was saying at the start of the video that a lot of these things like soils can affect how much you water. So really make sure you stick around and take notes and learn everything here because it's gonna be so valuable to uh, the success of your Japanese black pine. Now, when we talk about overwatering, it's very hard to actually overwater a bonsai by giving it uh, water too frequently, okay? When we talk about overwatering, usually it's more of a problem of the soil substrate than it actually is of the person giving the tree water too frequently. Now what I mean by that is if we're using inorganic materials, pumice, lava rock, akadama, things like that, it's very well draining. So you put water in, it's gonna drain straight out the bottom of the pot and those substrates will actually hold a little bit of moisture and the tree will take what it needs. But any excess water is just gonna come straight out the bottom of the pot. Now, if you pot your Japanese black pine up into a bonsai pot in organic materials, such as uh, river sand, um, coco kior, or peat moss, some people call it, pine bark, those kinds of things. What can actually happen is as those materials break down, or even freshly potted, if you've got um, the wrong kind of gauze in the bottom of your drainage holes, they can get clogged up. That very dense organic material can become cloggy and muddy and what will actually happen is it'll clog up those drainage holes and every time you water, not all the water is going to drain out of the pot and you're going to have a little column of water in the bottom of the pot that's just going to stay in there indefinitely. And your root system is going to be sitting in that little column of water indefinitely and that's how you get root rot. Those roots have to stay in there for a few weeks before they get root rot. But if they continually sit in that column of water, that's how your tree will suffer ill health due to overwatering. So there's a little bit of a misconception there of overwatering is people giving the tree water too frequently when it's actually not. It's actually really a problem with the substrate. It's much, much harder to kill your tree by giving it not enough water than it is to give it too much water, okay? Now, in saying that, if your tree is receiving too much water, it's sitting in a column, the soil substrate's not really draining that much, the Japanese black pine will actually give you an indicator that that is happening. And that is going to be in the form of a yellowing needle, okay? Now, there are a few other things that can cause a yellowing needle. One of those can be cold winter temperatures, and the other thing can be not enough fertilizer. Now, it's gonna come down to you as the grower to assess the situation, to assess your care of that tree and think to yourself, well, are we coming into winter? Maybe the needles are going yellow because of the cold weather. Or maybe you're in the middle of summer, so cold weather's not even, not even a factor here, but your needles are going yellow. So now you need to look. Have you been fertilizing that tree properly? Maybe that's the issue. Or have a look at your soil substrate. Have you got organic materials in a bonsai pot and that water column is building up and the tree is suffering ill health? So that, that's how we look at that. But I'm just giving you a basic rundown of watering for the Japanese black pine because most of it's gonna come down to your soil and your environment. Whether you have lots of rain, whether you don't have rain at all. Well, okay. <laughs> Everybody has rain, but you know what I mean, if you don't have a lot of rain. 
Um, I know some people that only have 300 mils of rain a year. Where, where I live, we have 300 mils of rain in a week. Okay, so that's what I mean by that difference there. Um, some places are like very humid, some places are arid. So it just comes down to your environment. And another thing that can actually affect how much you water your uh, bonsai, and this is any bonsai, not just Japanese black pine, is how windy it is. The more wind and airflow that's moving through the tree, the more that tree is transpiring, losing water out through the needles or out through the leaves, depending on what species you've got. So the windier it is, the more often you're gonna to have to check your tree for watering. And then also again, that comes down to your substrate. How much moisture your substrate holds. If you've got a substrate that doesn't hold a lot of moisture and it's very windy outside, you may be watering two to three times in that day, okay? So we'll keep going through these things and hopefully it'll all start making sense to you. So let's move on to our next one, which is fertilization. All right, when we talk about fertilization of a Japanese black pine, it's actually very simple, but we need to break it down into two separate stages. And we do this with most bonsai anyway, but these two stages are development and refinement. And the fertilization process on the both of these are actually opposite. Okay, so let's start off with development. Let's say you've got a little starter, Japanese black pine, okay? What your goals are for that tree is to grow it really fast, get it really thick, um, unless you're gonna have a different style of tree, but most Japanese black pines, we want those big girthy bases. So we're gonna just wanna grow that tree as quick as possible. Now to achieve this, we're gonna wanna have a high nitrogen content fertilizer year round. So don't take it off. Just all year round, high nitrogen fertilizer. Anything over the value of 10 in the NPK, the N in NPK being nitrogen. So when you go out and buy your fertilizer, most fertilizer bags have your N, your P and your K, and then you'll have a ratio of three numbers. Let's just say 10, 10, 10, for example. If you can get something that's higher than 10 in nitrogen value, then that is good for development, okay? because that's gonna, we know that nitrogen is the fertilizer component that gives us elongation and growing. So basically what the, that high nitrogen content is going to do for us is it's gonna give us more elongated branches and it's going to give us elongated needles. Now, when we get elongated needles on a Japanese black pine, we're getting more surface area on that needle for photosynthesis. And the more photosynthesis we get from the sun, the more energy we get in the tree. The more energy we get in the tree, the quicker it grows. You see how that works? So the bigger the needles we can get in the development process, the more energy we're gonna give that tree. So more nitrogen, more, more growth, more longer needles, longer branches, and the longer the branches are, the more needles we're gonna have on them. So you can see how that all kind of works. Now, when we go into refinement, we want the opposite effect. Now, we want really small needles, we want really small inner nodes on our branching. So, how do we get that? You got it, less nitrogen. So, in the refinement stage, we want an N value in our NPK, we want an N value of below 10. Okay, and the lower you can get, the kind of the better. So if you can get around an eight, the better. So we still need nitrogen in the system though. We don't want to completely take it away because nitrogen helps with the coloring of the tree. So it's going to look a lot healthier along with some other stuff, but we want to keep it in there. But here's the trick. Four weeks before we hit the summer period. So in Australia here, our summer starts in December, okay? First of December, that's the first day of summer. So first of November, I'm taking my fertilizer off the trees, okay? This is in refinement because we want the fertilizer to have run out of the system by the summer period because in summer, we decandle our trees. And at the time of decandling, we don't want any nitrogen at all in the system. And I'll explain that during the pruning um, segment okay that's why I'm doing this in this order so 
for me, I do it just on a schedule, okay? Start of November, which is four weeks before summer, I take my fertilizer off my Japanese black pines. Some people will do this differently, okay? You gotta understand that when we decandle, and I'll quickly go into this here, just so we can have an understanding of what I'm talking about. Our bigger trees, we do first, we decandle first, okay? Our medium trees, we decandle halfway through summer. And our shohin trees, we decandle at the end of summer. So as those weeks roll over, some people, you know, if you're gonna do your large trees, okay, you'll take it off four weeks before summer starts, okay? With your medium-sized tree, so here in Australia, instead of me taking the fertilizer off the first week in November, I might wait halfway through November to take off the fertilizer. You see what I mean? And then so on and so forth. But for me, I just don't worry about it. Start of November, four weeks before summer, I take my fertilizer off because it takes four weeks for that nitrogen to leave the system. And then that way we're ready to decandle our trees. So with that in mind, let's move on to the next section, which is pruning. All right, so pruning our Japanese black pine. Once again, we're gonna to have to break this up into two sections, being development and refinement. So we'll start off with development. And I mean, this is pretty simple, okay? So like I said before, we, in the fertilization section, the more needles we have on the tree, the more branches, the more growth we're gonna have and quicker, okay? But we do have to keep an eye out for flaws in the tree or where we're gonna create flaws. Now the trick with Japanese black pine is, is we have a growth pattern that we call world growth, okay? Now, we know on some trees that we have an opposite leaf pattern. In this is looking straight down the branch, okay? Straight down the tip of the branch. So we'll get two buds that pop on side of each other, okay? The opposite side of each other. That is an opposite growth pattern, okay? And then with some trees, we also know if we're looking at the top of the branch, we have an alternating leaf pattern, which is like that, where the buds alternate from each other. Okay, but with the Japanese black pine, what we have is what we call a world growth pattern, which is where we literally get buds the whole way around the branch, okay, in a circular pattern like so, which is our world growth. Now, what can actually happen here with the world growth pattern is because we've got all these branches around like this, if we draw a trunk on a Japanese black pine, say we're developing, right? And I'm just gonna draw a straight trunk here just for illustration purposes. Now, on a regular tree, we might get a bud here, and then we go up here, and then we get a bud here, say we've got an opposite you know, leaf pattern tree, and so on and so forth. We can let these grow, and we're not really gonna have an issue, okay? But with a Japanese black pine, what we get is we get that, that whirl growth pattern, okay? So we get bar branching like that, and not only do we get bar branching, but we'll get another branch here, we'll get a branch here, we'll get another branch here, and these are all in the one section of the tree. Now, what's gonna happen is if we allow all these branches to grow out really long and strong, okay? We're gonna have a lot of energy focused on this one section of the tree. And then what we're gonna end up having, if we have our trunk that keeps growing up like this, we're gonna have a big ball of growth on our tree like that. Now, let me show you what that's gonna look like if I take all that stuff away. Now, before I show you what that's gonna look like, I'll show you what we want. We want taper, okay? In any bonsai tree, we want taper. Thicker at the bottom, thinner at the top. What's gonna happen if we let that world growth just go, that's what we're gonna end up with. We're gonna end up with a golf ball or a knuckle, whatever you wanna call it, in the middle of the tree and it's gonna be really ugly. So, 
This is where it's gonna come down to you as the grower. You've gotta watch that tree like a hawk, okay? So, while ever you can, leave as much growth on that tree as possible because that's gonna give you the most um, surface area on your needles and it's gonna give you the most energy like we talked about before. But with that energy all in that one spot, you're gonna eventually get swelling. So once you start to see that swelling happening, you're gonna to have to take away branches, okay? Now, you might be able to get away with just taking one of those branches off to begin with, just to slow that growth down, or it might be two, okay? But eventually, you're gonna to have to go back to the rule of twos, okay? Two branches in any one spot. Now, you've gotta remember, when we've got a trunk, and we've got a first branch, the trunk counts as one, okay? And your branch is two. So that's our rule of two. And then obviously once we get out to here, we can have two there, okay? So we've got two in this section, and then we have two in this section, two in this section, okay? That's our rules of two. At any junction, any junction, we only want one, two. Any junction, one, two. A junction, one, two. One, two. Okay. That's gonna stop your swelling from happening. So that's how, in development, we need to keep an eye on our growth and make sure that we're not letting that swelling happening. But at the same time, we're trying to keep as much on the tree as possible. I know it sounds confusing, but it's not like these things are just growing rapidly overnight. You'll see, you'll see the tree starting to swell and you think to yourself, oh, I need to take some energy away from that particular section. So I'm gonna remove one of the branches from there, okay? So that brings us next to our next thing, which is big cuts, okay? When do we perform these big cuts on a Japanese black pine? Well, we perform these big cuts, ideally, at the end of summer, early autumn, okay? And the reason why I say end of summer, early autumn is because the tree sap flow is beginning to slow down. During early spring, through spring, early summer, that's when the, the sap flow in that tree and the growth production, right, our vegetative growth season, that's when the sap is moving the most rapidly. And what's gonna happen is if you've got your tree, say you've got a big branch here, right? And you've got lots of sap flow up into that branch. You cut that branch off, that sap flow just leaks out of the tree, right? And that's just basically leaking energy. So what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that we're cutting that tree end of summer, early autumn to prevent as much sap flow as possible. Now in saying that, I'm not saying that you cannot cut the tree during spring. You absolutely can, but you need to take some precautionary measures. You don't wanna be cutting five, six big branches off a tree during spring, okay? Because you've got five, six big wounds where you're gonna have sap just flowing out everywhere, all over your tree. And you're just gonna rid that tree of all of its energy, okay? The other thing that if we're gonna cut in spring, okay, we've got this big branch just here, We've cut it, what we can do is the tourniquet method, okay? Where we come in, we get a bit of bonsai wire, we wrap it around our cut site just here, and we tighten it off really tight, okay? To try and limit the amount of sap flow that can get past that point, okay? And then also, at the end of the cut site, put some cut putty over it to try and seal it in. But as I said, you don't wanna be in spring cutting off a lot of big branches. Say for example, you've noticed some swelling in this area because you've got a branch here and you've got a branch here and a branch here because of your wall pattern. Maybe you can come through and maybe cut this branch and this branch off, okay? But you don't wanna be cutting that off, that off, that off, and a branch up here and a branch up here and a branch up here because now you've just got places everywhere where that, seep, that sap's gonna seep out. All right, now that we've talked about pruning in the developmental stage, let's have a little chat about pruning 
in the refinement stage of Japanese black pine. This is where things start to get fun and you start to see a lot of the results. So in your development, remember, you're just trying to thicken the tree, you're trying to you know, create those first branches, get them nice and thick, get everything wired up while it's young, you know, get your trunk movement and all that stuff. But now that we're into refinement, we need to start um, refining our branches, so getting our branch structure, and we need to work on getting that need, getting those needles a lot smaller, which part of that is the fertilizer, remember that we talked about earlier, and the part that I'm about to talk about now. Okay, so in refinement, we really only need to touch the tree two times during the year. You might say there's a third time, which is our needle plucking, but you can do that at any time of the year. But there's two major times of the year where we're gonna to touch our black pine now. One is in summer, when we're gonna perform our decandling work, and two is in autumn, when we're gonna do our bud selection work. So, what are they? Now, what'll happen with a branch? If you let a Japanese black pine branch grow unhindered, it's gonna look something like this. You're gonna get some growth, then you're gonna get some needle mass, okay? And say that's our first year growth, okay? Next spring, you're gonna see a candle elongate. This is what we call our candle. And all up the length of that candle, you're gonna have needles, right? Like that, needles. And then you're gonna have needles on the end of it. And that's our second year growth just there. If we let this grow again, same thing's gonna happen. We're gonna get an elongated candle and we're gonna get needles all up that candle, right? And we're gonna get that growth. Now, between every year of growth, you're gonna have this little gap, okay? So, first year growth, second year growth, third year growth, right? You'll always see this little gap in between the needle growth. And depending on how healthy that branch or tree is, that gap will be bigger. If you've got really weak candles, you're gonna have a really small gap. If you've got really strong candles, you're gonna have a bigger gap, okay? Now, one other thing I will say about this growth too is you're not gonna just get straight growth like this. You're also gonna get little buds on the side that'll pop out, okay? So these will be secondary branches and they'll do the same thing, right? But they're not gonna grow as strong as this main section. They're gonna be weaker, all right? So you'll get, you get that kind of thing happening all throughout the tree. Now, once, this is what we're gonna have on the tree after we've developed, all right? So what we usually do is from the stage of development, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna leave the growth on the tree, we're gonna put it in a bonsai pot, okay? We're gonna cut the roots, put it in a bonsai pot, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit further down, repotting. But we're gonna cut the roots, put it in a bonsai pot, and then knowing our first law of Japanese black pines is the strength in the roots, we're gonna let it sit in that bonsai pot with all this growth on for a year, okay? All this growth is gonna mean energy, which means it's gonna repair that root system. And then the next year around, we're gonna have a really healthy root system, which means we can now start our work on our Japanese black pine, okay? So just remember that. When we go out of development, don't cut your tree all down. We wanna put that tree in a bonsai pot because we're likely gonna cut 50% of the roots off to get it in the bonsai pot. So we're gonna cut the roots off, leave all the needles on the tree, leave it in that bonsai pot for a full season. Let that root system get healthy, okay? Because that's where our energy is in our pine. And then the next season around, we can start our refinement work, which we'll talk about now. Okay, so now we're in our bonsai pot. We've got all our crazy growth all over the tree. Summer, we want to decandle, okay? So, what is decandling? Say we've got this growth on the tree here in summer. We're gonna come through and say we wanna come back here. It depends on how long you want your branch. You can do it here, you can do it here. But remember, with a Japanese black pine, 
and I'm gonna just quickly segue off here because I think this is important. We never wanna cut a branch. So say we've got needles here, right? Needles here. We never wanna cut a branch here where there's no needles. No needles behind the cut site, okay? That's now a dead branch. There's also a situation where you might have a branch, right? And you've got a little tiny bud here. Maybe you've got a little tiny bud just here, but you've got lots of growth, growth here, okay? And lots of growth up here again, your second year. Now you might say to yourself, well, I can cut here, okay? Because I've got growth just here and I've got growth just there. But you don't wanna do that either because this growth here and this growth here is not strong enough yet to take over the power of that branch. It's not gonna have enough energy to pull sap flow up into this branch. So if you do wanna use these buds, these little buds that you had growing here, you need to wait until those needles become nice and long and nice and strong and nice and photosynthetic before you cut back to them, okay? You don't wanna do that too early. All right, now that I've segued off into that, we can get back to our candle pruning. So, we've got our first year's growth here, which at this point, we would be calling these three-year-old needles, okay? So if you only want your branch this short, you can candle prune back to here. But if you want your branch to be out here, you can candle prune back to here. That's up to you, okay? But one little tip I'll give you too is you don't wanna kinda let the branch get too far away with growth, okay? Because by the time you get back to candle pruning back to these needles, these needles are quite old and spent, okay? They're not quite as photosynthetic as they used to be. But we can come in and we can candle prune back to there. Okay, so now we've got rid of, all, rid of all this growth. And we wanna leave a little bit of a stub, okay? So if we say we zoom in, let's pretend this is our zoomed in uh, view. We've got our needles here, our needles here. And this would have been our elongating growth and we've got our gap and we've got our second set of needles there. If we're gonna come through and candle prune, we don't wanna candle prune right back to this set of these first needles here, okay? We don't wanna come back and do that flush because what we're likely gonna see is a little bit of dieback, okay? So then we're gonna end up losing, losing that. What we wanna do is we wanna come through and we wanna cut back here, leaving a bit of a stub, that way this dies back and this section's still fine, okay? So, we've candle pruned, we've left our little bit of a stub. Now what's gonna happen is the tree's gonna throw buds all around that cut site. It might be four, five, six, seven, eight buds. They can throw a lot of buds. Remember, they grow in that wall pattern. So where you've got your cut, you're just gonna have little buds all over it, everywhere, okay? Even, even out here, just buds everywhere. And that's our decandling, okay? That's why we do it, we decandling to get those buds. Now, before I move on, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll go into it a little bit more in depth here, we do have different times during the summer that we decandle some trees. And we even can decandle them at the same tree at different times. Now, why would we do that? And this all comes down to the energy of the tree, okay? And also the size of the tree. <clears throat> so if we've got a big, you know, sumo-sized tree, right? We want to do that tree right at the start of summer. We want to decandle because it has all summer to grow those new needles and new buds and it'll grow longer needles, okay? And those longer needles will be more in proportion to a big tree. But imagine if you had needles that were this long on a little showing tree, it wouldn't look right. So what you need to do is your smaller trees, your little showing trees, 
you need to do them at the end of summer. That way they only have a little bit of time to get those needles and buds out and you're gonna have really tiny needles. Along with the fertilization like I explained earlier, not having nitrogen, okay? So we do our biggest trees the start of summer, we do our medium sized trees in the middle of summer and we do our smaller trees at the end of summer. That, that tells us how much growth we're gonna get on each one. Bigger trees, we want bigger needles more in proportion to the size of the tree. Littler trees, we want littler needles more in proportion to the size of the tree. Okay, so that one's pretty basic. But why would we do candle pruning at different times on the same tree? Some people call this the 10 day technique, okay? So what we wanna do is we want to, um, we wanna decandle our weaker branches first, okay? And we wanna do our stronger ones last. Now, what does this do? Once again, if we do our weaker ones first, this gives them more time to grow and catch up to the stronger ones, which we do last, okay? So it kind of gives your weaker ones a head start ahead of your stronger ones. If we did, you know, say we've got a, a weak branch and a strong branch, we do them both at the same time. Once again, the strong branch is gonna take off, the little branch isn't, okay? So if we do the, the little branch first, it's got time to grow, and we do the stronger one last, and by the time we finish our candle pruning season, they've kind of grown at the same pace, right? So that's why we would do what we call the 10 day technique. We do our weaker ones first, wait 10 days, do our medium ones, wait 10 days, and then do our strongest candles after the, the 10 days. And then that kind of just um, evens everything out on the tree. All right, now we're gonna have a quick chat about needle plucking on Japanese black pine. And as I mentioned, this can be done any time of the year, okay? And we need to refer back to our two laws of Japanese black pine. And the second law being that energy distribution is done through needle mass on the tree, okay? So if you've got one branch that's got a ton of needles on it, and you've got another branch that's not got a lot of needles on it, that other branch is gonna stay weak, okay? While the tree feeds that other branch with all the needles on it, all the energy, okay? And this usually happens up the top of the tree. Very apically dominant, okay? So what we wanna do is, if I draw another really basic tree again, we've got a lower branch here, let's just say is really skinny and weak, wasn't developed properly. Okay, we go up the top of the tree and then we start getting, you know, bigger branches and stuff like that, which we don't want, <clears throat> okay? Now, this little guy down here, we know a Japanese black pine, they have pairs of needles, okay? So two pairs of needles, okay? So that's one pair of needle. Then you'll have another set of needles here Okay, so what I've drawn there is eight sets of needles, right? So there's 16 individual needles there, but we talk about them in sets, okay? So there's eight sets of needles on that branch. <clears throat> but let's just say up here, Now I'm only gonna do <clears throat> 14 sets of needles there just for illustration purposes. Okay, but you can see up here, there's more needles here than there is here. So this branch here, when the tree sends energy up, it's gonna send it mostly to this branch, a little bit to this branch, okay? So this is gonna get favored. And as you can see, this is really gonna mess up our taper because this branch up here it's just gonna get all the energy, it's gonna thicken up while this little guy down here just stays weak and thin. So what we need to do is we need to do needle plucking, okay? We need to do this over the whole entire tree. And generally what we do is we find our weakest significant branch, okay? We don't find our weakest branch, we find our weakest significant branch. And what do I mean by that? 
we find the weakest branch on the tree that is actually important to the design. So let's just say this was gonna be our first branch. That's gonna be our weakest significant branch. And we look at it and we say, okay, it's got eight pairs of needles or roughly thereabout. You're not gonna sit there and count every single needle or pairs of needles on your tree. But you're gonna say, okay, that's roughly about eight sets of needles, okay? So what we need to do is we need to come up to the top of the tree and we need to needle pluck this guy and every other branch down to eight sets of needles to match this one. So when the tree gives out energy, it's giving this branch just as much energy as it's giving this branch. But let's say you need to rectify something. Maybe you wanna keep an extra set of needles on this branch just to give it that little bit extra energy, okay? So this is how we distribute energy on a Japanese black pine. And a lot of the time we wanna keep even energy over the whole entire tree. So that's why we will find our weakest significant branch and we'll needle pluck all the other branches down to the same amount of needles that's on our weakest significant branch. And that is how we distribute the energy over the tree. Now, a little tip. When we're needle plucking, a common thing that I see people do, okay, say we've got a branch, okay, very basic branch, and we've just got needles the whole way up the branch, right? A very strong branch. Okay? Something I'll always see people do is come through and needle pluck all the way to the end, like that. Okay? So now, I might just get rid of that. Okay, so now you've got this branch where all your needle mass is on the very tip of the branch, and then back here we've got nothing, okay? And we've got to remember that in development, we should be needle plucking as well, because we don't want the top of the tree growing more rapidly than the bottom of the tree. So even in development, please, needle pluck your trees. Keep that energy distribution even across the whole entire tree. Now the reason why this is important what I'm just about to talk about in development is, say you've needle plucked all your needles out onto the tip of the tree. Now you've really got nothing in back here, okay? What we wanna do is we wanna try and keep maybe a set of needles there, set of needles here, set of needles here. Further back on the branch, we wanna keep a little bit of energy in here, but what we want to do is, if you're gonna get back budding on a Japanese black pine. And the way to get back budding on a black, black pine, by the way, is to feed it full of energy. The more energy this branch has, the more likely it is to back bud. Okay, if it's a very weak branch, not much chance that it's gonna back bud. So if you want back budding, full of fertilizer, full of energy, let the branch grow, you'll get back budding. Okay, and what we wanna do is we wanna keep old sets of needles back down the back end of the branch because if we want back buds in there, we are more likely to get back buds at the point of these needles that we kept on than we are anywhere else, okay? That's our most likely chance of getting a back bud. So what you wanna do is keep in mind while you're doing this needle plucking, if you're knowing that you're growing this branch out to develop it, but later on you're gonna come back in, now's the time for you to say, well, in my final design, I'd really like a branch here, and I'd really like a branch here. So keep those needles there, because the chances of you getting a back bud here and here are much higher, okay? So what you can do, is if we're looking at this branch side on, okay? This is a side on look at the branch. You've got needles all over it, okay? All your needles on the top here, you can pluck them off. All your needles on the bottom, you can pluck them off. Your needles on the side of your branch, they're your lateral needles. That's where you want the buds to pop out. If this is an overhead view of the branch, you want your buds to pop out on the side of the branch. So keep some lateral old needles on the side of your branch here, and you're likely gonna get back budding in a very optimal position. All right, so let's have a chat about soils and substrates, okay? 
Japanese black pine, it does get pretty thirsty during the spring and the summer period. And it also likes a lot of oxygen, that balance of water and oxygen. So normally a lot of the time you'll hear when we go into refinement, we use one part Akadama, one part pumice, and one part lava rock, okay? Now, depending on where you are, you might not be able to uh, get your hands on these substrates. So you're gonna have to come up with something different, okay? Um, and that all just comes down to what you can get your hands on and what you can't. Now, personally, me here, we don't really get much lava rock around here. So rather than lava rock, we replace that with zeolite, which is something that we can get a hold of. Um, so I'll use one part Akadama, one part pumice, and one part lava rock, and that's in refinement. If we're developing our black pine, we want organics. And when it comes to black pine, um, pine nuggets are really, really good for a Japanese black pine in your organic mix, okay? You'll get mycorrhiza in your pot, which is your beneficial fungi, and um, that's really going to communicate with your root system and you're gonna just get a much healthier tree. And you'll know mycorrhiza when you see it because it's like a, a whitey color, but it's like spider webs almost on the surface of your um, root system. So when you pull it out of the pot, you'll see all like this white colored um, webby kind of um, fungi on the, on the outside of your root system. So that's mycorrhiza, really healthy for your tree. Okay, <clears throat> um, root aphids, they look much the same, but a lot of the time with root aphids, they're um, a lot more concentrated and they're in dots, okay? Mycorrhizas spread out, it's kind of translucent and webby, where uh, root aphids are concentrated in clumps and really white dots, and you'll see them actually clinging to the roots. And they'll leave like a white substance on the outside of the pot as well. Okay, so, <clears throat> When it comes to our soils, we need to determine our environment, our availability to water, and what's available to us, okay? But the most important is, okay, so the simple way to put it, when we're developing organic materials, okay? The tree is gonna grow much quicker in those organic materials. Once we move into a bonsai pot, into refinement, we go into inorganic materials, okay? So like our akadama, our pumice, our lava rock, all those kind of things. Now, how do we work out the mix for those? As I said, usually it's just a basic mix, one to one to one ratio of those substrates that I've pointed out before. But how do we come to that conclusion, okay? This is, a, this is the part of learning bonsai where we need to learn why are we doing that? We don't just learn the one to one to one ratio because then we know nothing really, okay? So why and how do we choose our substrates? Now this will go for pretty much most of your bonsai, okay? It comes down to the species on how much it does or doesn't like water and it comes down to your availability to water and it also comes down to your environment. All of these things are gonna play and factor into what um, mix that you use. Now, if you live somewhere where it rains a lot throughout the year, obviously your tree is gonna cop a lot of water, which means you're going to need substrate that's heavier on the drainage side of your mix than it is water retention capacity, okay? So if you live somewhere where it rains a lot, you're not gonna have a mix that's two parts Akadama, one part um, pumice and one part lava rock, because we know that Akadama holds a lot of moisture. And if you've got a lot of rain, you don't wanna hold a lot of moisture because you're getting a lot of moisture passing through the pot, okay? So, you know, if you live in an area that really rains a lot, you might have one part Akadama to two parts pumice. Okay, makes sense. So you've got less water holding, more drainage, okay? Now, if you live in a really arid area, it's really hot, 
you might go two parts akadama, one part pumice, okay? Because now you've got that water holding retention and you've got less drainage, okay? So the tree is going to have moisture in it for longer. Now, at this part of the video right now, the people who already know what they're doing are screaming at me, okay? Because we don't use two parts akadama in a pine. And they're absolutely 100% right, okay? And why don't we do that? It all comes down to the repotting frequency, okay? But you might have a situation where you've got no choice, okay? And you wanna practice bonsai. And I'm not gonna tell you that you can't have two parts akadama in your pine, meaning that you now cannot have a black pine because of this reason, okay? And I'll explain it now. Akadama breaks down, okay? And it takes about 18 months for Akadama to break down. And what happens, say we've got these big particles of Akadama, right, in our soil mix, and in between these parts of Akadama, we've got all these holes where oxygen can occupy. And even inside the Akadama, we've got little crevices and stuff that the the oxygen can actually occupy. Now, what happens, as this Akadama begins to, to break down over time, and it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, okay, these gaps begin to get filled in, okay? And there's no more room for oxygen in that mix, okay? So what happens then, we lose our balance of water and oxygen, and also, the other thing that'll happen is the, the tree won't percolate properly, so the water won't get through properly. So after about 18 months, you need to replace that akadama, which means repotting. Now, Japanese black pines, junipers, most of our conifers really, we don't want to repot them before five years, okay? We want to keep that tree in the pot for five years before we repot it. This gives our root system enough chance to bifurcate and become really tight and compact, which once again gives us those smaller needles on our tree, okay? <clears throat> if we don't have that really fine, tight root system that we get in that mix, once again, we end up with those long needles. So the wrong soil along with the wrong fertilizing process, we end up with those big needles that we don't want, okay? So we really wanna try and keep our Japanese black pine in the bonsai pot for a minimum of five years. And if we've got two parts akadama, one part pumice, not possible, okay? But this is where you, as the bonsai artist, needs to understand that, hey, I've got a choice to make here. If I live in a really arid area and I can only water once a day, I can't have that mix of one to one to one. Because by the time I water in the morning, go out to work all day, come home, that black pine is gonna be very dry by the time you get home. You've missed your second watering. So to make up for that, you may need to put two parts akadama to one part pumice to make up for that moisture retention, just to make your tree live. But what that's gonna mean is you're gonna to have to repot that tree every two years to replace that akadama, which means you're probably gonna not gonna get as nice of growth on top of the tree in terms of small needles and stuff like that. But this is the trade-offs that we've got to make, you know. In the perfect world, one to one to one mix, we're home to water two to three times during the summer, beautiful. But unfortunately, not all of us have that um, you know, have the ability to water three times a day. So that's why when it comes down to our substrates, we need to know all these different things, you know, humidity versus an arid environment, an environment that has lots of rain versus an, an environment that doesn't, an environment that has a lot of wind, coastal areas, okay, versus inland areas that don't have as much wind. All these things factor in how often that we need to water our tree, okay? And when it comes down to our substrates, the best mix for a pine, definitely one to one to one ratio, okay? But 
If you're not home to water a lot, you might have to have an extra part Akadama to keep that moisture in it, to just keep the tree alive, okay? But that's how we choose our soils. I hope that made a lot of sense. I know there was a lot of running around in that, but you need, you need to sit down, calculate what kind of environment you've got, how often you can water, and what's available to you. But at least you know now that more parts Akadama, you have to repot every two years to stop the tree from choking. But ideally, we don't wanna be repotting every two years. But if that's your only choice, that's what you've gotta do. If you want a Japanese black pine, and that's your only choice, then go for it. But if you're home, you can water a lot during winter, no, uh, during winter, during summer, then go for the one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one mix. It's gonna get you the best results. You're gonna be able to repot in that five-year period because you're gonna have more pumice in there that doesn't break down, which is gonna keep that oxygen in the soil, right? Um, and yeah, you, you're just gonna have better results. So let's move on to our next segment, which is black pine design. All right, this will be a very quick segment when it comes down to Japanese black pine design. We're just gonna talk about the common designs. You, as the artist, can make the choice. Whatever you wanna do, whatever makes you happy, you design the tree your way, okay? But if you're learning, and you want the most common way to style a Japanese black pine, you want to follow those Japanese aesthetics, you want a Japanese looking tree, here's how you get it, okay? So, number one, most of the branches on Japanese black pines, we style them down and out, okay? That's our coniferous design on bonsai material. That's how they do it in Japan, and that's the most common um, style you're gonna see. Now, when it comes to the actual styles, you know, there's some trees that lend themselves to one style over another, but when it comes to Japanese black pine, the beautiful thing about them is the five basic styles of bonsai. And if you don't know what they are, you can sign up for our premium blog subscription where we go through all of those um, five styles. I'll leave a link in the description below. But the five styles of bonsai, Japanese black pine lend themselves to it perfectly, whether that's um, formal upright, informal upright, um, slanting, semi-cascade or cascade. Japanese black pine does fine in all those styles and looks absolutely fantastic. So it just comes down to when your tree's in development um, and you're starting to see different characteristics of the tree and what they'll lend themselves to. Keep those five styles in mind and you'll be well on the way to designing a good looking Japanese black pine. All right, now. Last but not least, repotting Japanese black pine. Okay, so <clears throat> we'll just simply start off with when, okay? Early spring is when we want to be uh, repotting uh, Japanese black pine. Now, this is going to come down to your area because some early springs are different to other early springs. And what I mean by that is I know some people that get four weeks in the spring and then just suddenly overnight, they'll have a frost. They'll drop below zero, okay? I know some places, the minute spring starts, it's hot, it's warm, moving forward, okay? So you need to kind of know your spring. I would suggest keeping an eye on the tree too. As soon as those candle buds start to swell a bit, you know that the tree's starting to grow. It's starting to get that, that um, sap flow and that movement going. So that's the time that we want to be kind of repotting our Japanese black pine, okay? So keep in mind the timing is early spring, but just keep in mind what kind of spring you have. If you're somewhere where you have really cold winters and there's a chance of another cold snap within the first four weeks of spring, maybe hold out until you'll get, you've got two, three weeks of nice warm weather and you know you're not gonna get that cold snap. Because if you get that cold snap right after you repot that Japanese black pine, there's a chance you're gonna lose it or you're gonna get die back, okay? So, when it comes to repotting Japanese black pine, how much? Okay, 30 to 50% of the root mass you can take off, all right? Now, when I say that, keep in mind, you need to be looking at your tree and understanding how healthy that tree is. Now, if we're talking about a tree that's going into a bonsai pot, 
100%, you're probably gonna be cutting 50% of that root system off. But if that tree that's in development is looking really sickly, the needles don't look nice and vibrant and green, you haven't got real strong candles and growth, and you come through and you cut off 50% of that tree's energy, you could be doing detriment to that tree. So at that point, I'd be looking at that tree and saying, hmm, I'm gonna keep it in development for another year. In that year, I'm gonna fertilize, I'm gonna give it plenty of sun, nice amount of water, really try and get that tree healthy and get that root system nice and healthy. The law of pine, the health and energy is in the root system. Make sure that root system's healthy. If the tree's not looking good, pull it out of the black plastic pot, give it a quick inspection. Is there a problem in the root system? Get that rectified. Get the tree nice and healthy before you come through and you cut off 50% of its energy, okay? Now, if you have got a really healthy tree in development, you know, you've got that nice strong candle growth, you've got those nice vibrant needles, come through, you can cut 50% of those roots off into a bonsai pot. Like we spoke about before, you keep all that growth on, it's going to work for the tree, it's going to rebuild that root system in the bonsai pot, the next year you can start your refinement work, okay? Let's just say we've got an old tree in refinement, okay? We need to repot that tree. It's been in the pot for more than five years, in the right substrate. Remember, if you're in heavier parts Akadama than you are pumice, you may have to do this in two years, okay? But let's say perfect scenario, we're in the right substrate, it's been more than five years in the bonsai pot, that tree's starting to get really root bound now. Same timing, doesn't matter whether you're in development or refinement, same timing. We pull it out, but this time, what we're gonna do is we're not gonna cut 50% of the root mass off a mature refined tree. We're gonna come through, we're gonna take the bottom mat of roots off, okay, across the bottom, and we're gonna take, you know, maybe an inch off each side of the tree. And we just give it that little bit of room to grow back again. We don't wanna come through and really cut, cut back hard like we would a tree going into a bonsai pot. That's where we need to, we need to kind of separate the two terms. You know, some people say, when can I repot my tree? And they're talking about taking a tree out of a black plastic nursery pot out of development into a bonsai pot, into refinement. That really isn't repotting. When we talk about repotting, we're talking about taking a tree out of a bonsai pot, um, cutting a little bit of the root system back, as I said, just that bottom mat of roots and about an inch off each side, just to give that tree to, to grow again. Because we know that if the root system stops growing, the tree stops growing. And if the tree's not growing, it's dying, okay? So we always need to make sure we got room in the bonsai pot for the roots to grow. That's why we repot. We come through, take that bottom mat off, inch off each side. Now the tree's got room to grow a little bit more. Until next time we come in, we repot, we do the same process over and over again. If we're coming out of a nursery pot, we're cutting like 50% of the root system off to go into the bonsai pot. Then we're giving it room to grow, and then that repotting cycle starts, okay? Now, when we talk about our aftercare, once we've either um, potted a tree up or repotted a tree, either one of them, what we need to do is we need to take that tree and we need to put it in partial shade out of the wind for at least two weeks, okay? We need to let that tree recover, get its bearings back. This is the good thing about spring too. It's not overly hot, it's not overly cold. The tree's not gonna suffer a lot of shock. But as I said before, if you get sudden frost early spring, you, you wanna try and avoid that, okay? But our aftercare, we wanna keep it out of the wind because we've got, um, we've got a compromised root system here that's not taking up water. If you've got a lot of wind passing through that tree and it's transpiring rapidly, it can't take up enough water to replace all that transpiring water, okay? So we wanna keep it out of the wind for at least two weeks until it can get some root system established. We wanna keep it out of the direct sunlight for two weeks. The hotter that tree is, once again, the more it's transpiring the, the water out of its needles, and it's got a compromised root system that you can't take up water quick enough to replace the water that's leaving, then once again, we're gonna have an ill tree. 
So we need to protect the tree from wind and we need to protect the tree from direct sunlight, okay? For two weeks. Um, and then after that, we can slowly just start moving the tree back out into full sun again. But our aftercare, we need to have that aftercare. We don't wanna just chop a tree's root system, have it compromised and put it back out in direct sunlight, okay? All right, and just remember that when we're taking a, a tree out of a nursery pot and we're going into a bonsai pot, we're taking more of that root system off and it's more compromised than a tree that's been in a bonsai pot and we've only just taken the bottom mat and the side mats off, okay? So you may need to just watch the tree. Once it starts growing a bit more, then you can you know, be safe to kind of put it out. But remember, don't just chuck it straight out into that sunlight because you can do detriment to the tree. So, I know this has been a long one, but that's basically it. Hopefully you understand Japanese black pine a little bit now. Hopefully you understand the development process versus the refinement process, and you understand how each of these change for each of those and how they all melt in with each other um, and talk to each other. The soils and the watering and the fertilizing and the sunlight and all those kinds of different things. Hopefully you have a really good understanding of it. Um, let me know in the comments below if this video was helpful for you, if it was easier to understand, and if you wanna see more stuff like this, we will definitely do it. We do have an article on Japanese black pine on our premium blog at the moment, which is five years from nursery stock to show, okay? So that's five years from after the tree is developed into a bonsai pot to a show. If you'd like to learn that process, then you can go over and join up for our premium blog subscription, which is four articles a month you get, educational articles, and you can check them out wherever you are. Um, whether you're waiting in the doctor's office, you're on the train on the way to work, no matter where, you can bring up those articles and you can learn something. It's only five bucks a month. Um, for those of you that are in American dollars, USD, um, it'll be even cheaper for you guys because that's Australian dollars. So five bucks a month, four articles, you can continue your learning no matter where you are. And I suggest going and checking it out because as I said, we've got, um, we've got the rules of bonsai listed there. We've got the five basic styles of bonsai. We've got five years from nursery stock to show black pine. So go and check it out. I'll also leave a link down in the description below for our merchandise store. If you'd like to support us, you can grab some merchandise and keep an eye out for all the other links that we've got down there to our Facebook, Instagram, all those kinds of things. So don't forget to like, share and subscribe as well as that helps the channel grow. But until next time, enjoy your bonsai journey.